Well, this is it, the finale to what has been an exceptional, exceptional conference. I think those of us that have been watching it very closely, I mean, I've definitely enjoyed it. I've got so many messages in saying how interesting this conference has been. And I think it's really, I think someone said it just before when we were offline, this is a rock star panel to end this. I mean, I'm going to go around and get them to introduce themselves, but just to, just um, to say we've got Anand here, who's this Chief Strategy Officer of WellDoc. We've got Mateus here, who's the Chief Medical Solutions Officer at Gaia. We've got Elsie, who's the EU Commercial Director at Otsuka Pharmaceutical Europe. We've got Christian, who's the founder and CEO of Mary Health, and we've got John, who's the Chief Medical and Scientific Advisor at MindMaze. I don't know what else you want from a panel, but today we are going to be discussing what is going to define the success of the industry moving forward. So I wonder if we could go around, you guys could just introduce yourself um, to, to those of you that don't know, um, and then we can get started in conversation. So Anand, do you want to go first? And then um, we'll go Elsie, John, Mateus, and then Christian. Yeah, sure, Mala. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to those folks on this side of the pond. Uh, Anand I, our Chief Strategy Officer of WellDoc. Um, our WellDoc, for some of you who may know, uh, is a digital therapeutics company, really with a mission to leverage the digital therapeutics platform to help those who suffer from chronic conditions live better lives, achieve better outcomes. Um, whilst we started in type 2 diabetes, uh, we've really expanded to the broader cardiometabolic space of diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, et cetera and really have done it in a path of rigor, um, first to get FDA clearance here in the United States for diabetes, uh, randomized control studies, 55 peer reviewed publications. And really what's important is, is, and I say this somewhat tongue in cheek and I'll end with this, um, but I'm dead serious is, I think the blockbuster drug of this century going forward is gonna be the patient self-engaging. Uh, and digital therapeutics is an awesome mechanism to actually get them activated in their own health, you know, with the right clinical guidance from their healthcare providers. And so looking forward to sharing some insights with all of you this morning. Oh, sorry. If, if you guys could just carry on to Elsie, then John, then Mateus, then Christian. Oh, Elsie. I think she's frozen. Oh, never mind. John, if we go, if we go to you next. Yeah, hi. So I'm um, a Chief Medical and Scientific Advisor at MindMaze. I'm also in my medical and scientific life, a professor of neurology and neuroscience at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in the US, although I'm currently in Lisbon. Um, my maze um, is a digital therapeutics company that is focused on neurological injury and disease. Um, and it really basically takes two approaches, a sort of rehabilitation digital therapeutic solution and a neurorestorative digital therapeutic solution. Um, and the idea there is to really be a digital medicine, a sort of an immersive behavioral cognitive experience to both allow people to cope in everyday life after neurological injury and more ambitiously to rewire the nervous system. Alfie, I think you are back now. Would you? Mateus, if you go next and then we'll go around again, that's all good. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. The screen froze, <laughs> obviously technology. <laughs> Um, so yes, I'm Elsie Chan, the EU Commercial Director at uh, Otsuka Pharmaceuticals Europe. Um, so Otsuka is of course a uh, pharmaceutical company. We have a very global uh, presence and have been in the space of uh, particularly, you know, mental health um, as well as other therapeutic areas, but very vested interest in mental health in particular, uh, and which is why, you know, certainly digital therapeutics and innovations in mental disorders is a key focus for us, you know, in that also here. So it's a real pleasure to be here today and to be part of this panel and uh, engaging in this exciting you know, discussion for the future of DTX. Okay. Well, hello, hello everybody. And uh, good morning, as Anand said to the guys on the, <laughs> on the other side of the, of the pond. Uh, so I'm a TS, I'm a physician by training, um, background in pediatrics and pediatric surgery. Chief Medical Solution Officer at Gaia. Gaia has probably you might have heard Johan just a couple of sessions before. Uh, so I keep this pretty, pretty short and sweet. Probably the most mature digital therapeutic company in the world. It's developing digital therapeutics since 2000 uh, and have a more radical approach than maybe others. We believe in fully automated solutions. We develop software as a pill. We run clinical trials for these sort of products as a um, as software as a pill. Uh, because we believe that if you want to tackle the global burden in diseases, 
like obesity, diabetes, and others, um, there's no way other than technology because of scalability to to address this global burden of disease. And I'm happy to be to join the people today and share some ideas about how we see the industry moving forward. Hey everyone, I'm Christian Randa, the CEO and founder of Merrill Health. And uh, Merrill Health, we are a mainly a US-based company, uh, a telehealth provider with a digital therapeutic focused on um, mental health, uh, mainly depression and anxiety. And um, yeah, we've basically built a 12-week a program, uh, a digital therapeutic program for people with mild to severe depression and anxiety. And and definitely um, believe in, in the rigor, you know, scientific research, and we've done um, our part of the research uh, from the get-go when we founded the company in 2016, and, and that's basically been with UC Davis, uh, Stanford, and Harvard in the U.S., and, and also uh, just some time ago published our first RCT, <clears throat> randomized control trial, and are excited to hopefully very soon be publishing our second RCT with Stanford. And yeah, excited to be here today. Thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, this is such an important area, and I'm excited, excited. Thank you. Wonderful. I'm so grateful to have you all here and to be discussing this. For those of you that don't know me, I am Dr. Marla Walken, uh, doctor by background, but uh, work full time in the digital health space at Lever Clinic, which is the UK's first online pain clinic and host the Royal Society of Medicine's Digital Health podcast. So what we're going to be discussing today is kind of what the next steps are. We've heard a lot today about the progress that's been made, the need, why we've got insurers that are taking, you know, their eye on it and why they're now paying for digital therapeutics. We've heard about the different progress and journeys of emerging digital therapeutics at different stages. And the group that we've got here right now kind of have seen the the journey of digital uh, digital therapeutics going through from essentially being, you know, back in the, back many years ago when it was just an idea all the way through to where it is now, where it's very commercialized uh, and, a, and a scalable product and business model. So what we wanna be discussing now is without getting um without getting too many gimmicks in the space and as you know there are so many things that are emerging so many different products how can we ensure the sustainability of the space and the respect of the of the sector um and so i want to take it to john first actually john if you don't mind and i would love for you to to tell us as well as a as a professor and as someone that's in the space what have you been looking at to ensure sustainability um, in, in, the, in the sector? Well, I mean, I think the biggest issue is, of course, it's a moving target, right? In other words, me, most doctors are still not familiar or comfortable with the idea, as we just heard, as software, as a, you know, as a pill. Um, I think, so the first order of business is really, for example, through the Digital Therapeutic Alliance, is to really be very a little bit more specific and focused on what, what digital therapeutics is and allow people to understand the difference between it and digital health and digital medicine and digital assessment. So I think it would help us a lot if we just said, look, digital therapeutics is when it really is a prescribable medicine, just like a pill is, and, and, and sort of differentiate it from the digital noise around it, which is great, but assessments and information and ways of getting doctors and clinicians closer to patients, so that's one. Two, I think we're going to have to be very clear that we're not sort of in the wellness space. And I think it's going to mean that we're going to have to be very serious about uh, RCTs. Um, and I think that and the, and the exact nature of the evidence that regulators and payers are going to want is also a moving target. Um, and the final point I would say is it would really be great if everyone in the digital therapeutics industry laid out a roadmap of exactly what the sequence should be with respect to talking to regulators generating RCT evidence and talking to payers. I think it's still a very confusing sequence. And I think the we would really benefit from some kind of roadmap for everyone, learn from each other and see how to do that. And in, instead of seeing each other as competitors and you know not telling everyone what the more efficient sequence is. So that's what I would say is what's the nature of the evidence to doctors are going to have to become familiar with what it is so we have to be much more focused in what the definition is and then work out a roadmap to deal with this three-headed monster which is payers 
regulators and getting doctors to even bother to prescribe, even when there is a code, even when it is reimbursable. Fantastic points there, especially around the need for this roadmap, as we say, which I really do hope uh, this dream team kind of gets involved in because I think it would be fantastic. But Ananda, I want to take it to you because I know that you've, as John was very rightly saying, um, there's been this noise that has been around the digital therapeutic space. And at, at WellDoc, you, you really had to navigate around this noise. How, how have you been successful in presenting yourself as such market leaders amongst the noise? Yeah, and I'll build off of what John said. Everything you said is spot on, which is there are certain foundational elements, I believe, that are required. And you use the word, uh, Mala, you use the word, you know, how do you uh, drive sustainability? How do you gain the respect, right? Well, respect, as we all know, is earned. Uh, and it has to be earned through, you know, some, uh, you know, difficult tasks. And John outlined some of them. We have to go through the tasks of getting RCTs and getting the proper outcomes and actually showing that your intervention is efficacious, it's safe, it sustains, et cetera. And it's, uh, uh, it, therefore, it can be marketed, if you would, with safe use. At the same time, you want to ensure that all the things that we list uh, as a founding member of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance and on the board, we wanna make sure that all the things that we say at Digital Therapeutics Alliance is true. You want evidence, you want efficacy, right? You want cybersecurity, you want you know, integration into you know, uh, you know, healthcare as prescribed by a doctor. You want all of those foundational elements. So I think in many ways, you know, John hit all of those things. And even in the last talk, I just joined at the last minute and I heard Lucy mention, you know, all the logical things for a global market. You know, it has to be, clinically appropriate for the market it's in place, gonna be culturally appropriate. I mean, all those things are just, you would expect table stakes, right? But if you go beyond those, what I would call foundational pieces, those are kind of almost non-negotiable, right? You think I better have them if you wanna keep this as different uh, to John's words. But I think there's a couple of other things that we've learned, uh, especially in the last maybe three, four years. So I'll just enumerate them. So one of them is, if you focus on the patient and not on the condition, well, the patient who has diabetes and hypertension is also suffering mental health issues, doesn't go to three different places. They want to go to one place. And so to the extent that you can actually have a multi-disease but singular UX, right? very important. Why? It ultimately reduces friction of adoption. It reduces friction in engagement, right? Because they're going to go to one place, they're going to manage health. Because that's the way we as we're individuals, we're people, we think that way. We don't think about, I'm gonna manage my diabetes in the morning and I'm gonna manage my you know, hypertension in the afternoon. That's not the way we think, right? So singular UX multi-disease is one. At the same time, along that theme of friction reduction, you wanna make sure that these digital therapeutic platforms can interoperate where needed. And that means if they can interoperate with multiple uh, consumer wearable devices, why you may wanna include things like their weight, like their activity, et cetera, to then drive more sophisticated feedback and outcomes that come from the digital therapeutics platform. But you may also wanna include their pharmacy data, you wanna include their lab data, et cetera. So to the extent you can remove those integration points of friction, that's how you sustain uh, in your vernacular you know, press going forward. And then lastly, one that's really interesting that we've uncovered more recently, I'd say in the last year, which is everyone is investing in, in the platform capability. I and mean, you hear all the uh, discussions from all the retailers, you hear the discussions from all the hospital systems, the payers, et cetera. So they're putting billions of dollars into creating their digital front doors. And so in whole or in part, right? In whole or in part, in English, can you have a standalone digital therapeutic, but can it also become part of somebody else's? So think of the you know uh, 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 intervention within an intervention. And that requires all the things that John and I mentioned. It requires all the rigor, because you're, otherwise you're not gonna include things like this, right? It's like putting a drop of vinegar in a vat of milk, you'll spoil the whole thing. So it has to be something that maintains its integrity, its purity, its, its efficacy, all those things. And so I think to build on the foundational things John said, I think there are points of friction that if we're able to address whether it's friction in engagement, friction, friction in adoption, friction in integration with the clinical workflow, those things are important to gain the respect and if you would sustainability going forward. Boom, well said. That is really, really good and and really touches on a lot of the points that John had made as well. And I suppose um, just, just before we go to the next, uh, from my two cents is that, at Lever Clinic, we've seen as we're one of the first and only, you know, chronic pain clinics that's fully online. 
in the UK and a patient gets a full MDT of the clinical psychologist, the physiotherapist, the doctor, the nurse who sits and creates the care plan together with the patient in one place. I completely get what you're saying because going from pillar to post is not okay. But what we've seen as well is that digital therapeutics within a clin an online clinic environment also doesn't need to take the patient from pillar to post. It also needs to be integrated in, right? And that allows allows for a seamless journey. So I love what you're saying. And, and I suppose, Mateus, I, I wonder what you can um, you can tell us about. You're at the other. You're at the you know at the end of the spectrum where you have built, launched, progressed, done the RCTs, been there, done that. What's next on your end? I mean, like, where where are you guys planning on going next? Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I, I personally, I have the time of my life, uh, because, uh, we started 20 years ago, uh, and, uh, when the digital supply act in Germany came into place 2019, honestly, until 2018, I, I didn't believe that during my professional lifetime, work lifetime, I, I didn't expect seeing fully reimbursement for digital therapeutics in Germany. I was, I wasn't expecting that. Many things came together. We had a very ambitious young, or we have, a, we still have a very ambitious young minister of health. Uh, the pandemic, everything came together in a, in a very good sense of situation. But if you would ask me that 2018, I wouldn't have expected that. So um, sci sci science is, uh, science is, uh, is fundamental. Uh, I remember when we had the first clinical trial back in 2000, I don't know, five or something, we got ripped apart by physicians and therapists. They just, they thought we open up Pandora's box and, you know, want to replace everybody and everything. But building, building trust, one of, one of the things in building trust and, and, and getting things implemented in healthcare systems is evidence. It's painful, but it's, but it's, uh, and it's, it's costly. It takes time, but there's no way to, to bypass. And exactly what John said to, to separate apples from oranges. Um, you, we, we need the evidence and as a, as a, as an industry, as a whole, we have to unify in this in this positioning for for, for being successful as a as an industry in a, as a whole, and we see that it's rewarded. We see that we are now four of the five permanent listed products in Germany are from us from our company, right? So, and, and the the German Institute who's responsible, the German FDA who is responsible for, for the listing, they basically look at the scientific evidence, and this is the path forward. The German healthcare system is 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 looking for, and I think other healthcare systems will the same way. So, building products. Building the evidence, uh, you know, crying about failures because these things happen as well. Not everything what we do works out, um, but put on develop evidence and and still have fully automated solutions. Th this is the path forward for us at the moment. What Anand said, I, I, I completely agree. You're going to have platforms integration, one-stop shop systems, but everywhere we could we could integrate our solutions. Right? We could could be the 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 pill, the digital pill for for specific diseases where you can where you can integrate and make it make it easy and that's what we see in the german healthcare system the adoption is if you want to work with gps for example they say it has to be brutally easy right the, the products if you want to implement them in the healthcare system um it has to be brutally easy for them to to use them none of the the, the average age of physicians the, 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 don't be over too over optimistic okay the average age of physician in germany outpatient is 55 years the average age of a of a, of a German outpatient physicians, 55. Nobody is changing his his office to mission control for having, you know, 30 dip, different applications in this way. So if you want to the adoption rate there, we should focus on, on, on making it easy for them to to use. So this is definitely something we want to, to, to proceed in, in a in a global global perspective. No one is changing their office to mission control. I love that. It's so true, isn't it? Well, you're going to have them, Mana. You're going to have them. But if you look at the law of diffusion of innovation, this is the, the group of the 2.5% innovators or something. And crossing the chasm, I can everybody, you know, I recommend crossing the chasm. R read the book. Is How do we get the early majority? And we're talking about physicians. We're talking about patients. And... And policy makes. How do we get the? How do we get there? And for us, the, the strategy is is be be as as easy as possible to be implemented in the in the healthcare system. Elsie, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think that is one of the big challenges 
uh, that face digital therapeutics, really the practicalities of routine administration rights and fitting into clinician workflows being as simple to prescribe and to administer, you know, as medicines are sort of today, or at least, you know, um, no more difficult in terms of the barriers that are, you know, no new barriers arising, right, from the implementation. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly we're seeing improvements already in this. Um, Germany, certainly UK, you know, there are improvements being made in making these things practically accessible. But, you know, the struggle that we have and, and you know, some of the challenges that sometimes actually when you have different um, formulations and modalities of medicines, you often also have similar challenges with actually uh, finding a different pathway to distributing and accessing your product uh, is, is definitely quite uh, an immediate one for DTX because of the fact that, you know, in many countries is a very fragmented, you know, healthcare delivery, right? And who's paying for some of that? It's also quite fragmented, even when you have national guidance or national reimbursement, you still have the regional and the local, you know, practicalities to implement. And that's true for medicines very much as well. So, you know, there are more challenges, certainly, for DTX. But I think, you know, the way that uh, the trend, you know, that, that is going on in terms of the evolution of these systems and the processes is going in the right direction. Um, and we can certainly take some learnings about, you know, how things have been done in, in Germany. Um, and how things are evolving in the UK uh, and really help to kind of communicate and uh, collaborate with healthcare systems and you know, all the different stakeholders to kind of bring those cross-market learnings to, to help other systems establish their processes a bit faster and sooner. I love that insight. I love that insight because it is exactly that routine practicality how can we embed this not just behavioral change for the patients is it it's behavioral change for the for the prescriber so that they actually prescribe so maybe we need a digital therapeutic that we give to all healthcare professionals to get them to actually prescribe digital therapeutics maybe that would work right um christian i want to go to you because um you were just telling us about the fantastic work you've been doing about doing the rcts and getting that over the line and I would love to hear what the journey has been for you going from your first RCT to your second RCT. Um, are there any learnings, are there any kind of hiccups along the way that you can share for people that are thinking about doing their own RCTs? Yeah, thanks, definitely. Like, I think there's uh, many, many learnings along the way. I guess like for us, we are also like a, a little bit of a different animal because we are a service, a provider first and then a digital therapeutic second. So we make our claims based on our providers' licenses, and we kind of use technology to uh, make our providers scale dramatically. So one of our uh, mental health um, uh, therapists is currently eight times more scalable with the help of our technology, like decision making support, you know, decision support tools and uh, others like population health management tools that they use um, to be able to work with patients who are utilizing the digital therapeutic. And what we've kind of learned is that making this balance work where, you know, we are providing that human touch and, uh, you know, for the engagement, for the, the long-term follow-up. Um, and then on the other hand, like making, making this scalable is an interesting, uh, interesting challenge. And when it comes to RCTs, when we started our first uh, trial, I think it was like 20, 2017, 2018, that was our first version, you know, of our platform, of our product. And, and, you know, we kind of, that that was it was a good study and it was published some time ago um and in the results were, were were very good but but the other other thing was also that we kind of learned so many things as we went and and this is often like the challenge for uh for many early early stage companies and that like how do you balance like you need to move but on the other hand you need to get the evidence to be able to uh, get into the payer deals and so forth but what we were able to do which is potentially useful for other people as well is that we basically just like first started with with our first rct and then we also published and kept on publishing just a single arm observational data showing that okay this is the real world like 100 patients then we had 200 then 500 then 1000 2000 and we kept on showing that in different populations as we went into different payers different you know populations in the us like that actually the results are they're there like it's not just at 100 or that another so like 200 patients but it's continuous so we were able to show with the real world data that this thing actually works in the real world in the real practice and then on the side of that 
um, publishing also uh, the RCTs uh, as we went. So that's kind of been our approach. Uh, definitely some challenges. There are a lot of learnings. Happy to dive in a lot deeper. If, if anyone's interested, uh, just reach out. But you know, top level, uh, it's it's a balance. It's a balance. Wow, wow. And what a journey you've been on as well, because I think that it's such a, it's an underestimated from an outsider's perspective. Is that, is it, you know, you underestimate the amount of effort and work and late nights that you have to put into projects like this. So huge congratulations for your success. Um, I kind of want to open it up now for just the general discussion around um, the future of like the commercialization of this sector as well, right? So. A lot of the questions and thoughts that we've had during the day is, yeah, okay, well, it's good. Patients like it. Healthcare providers like it. We've got over this edge. Payers are starting to to, to pay for it. Um, but is this going to be a booming industry? Do we really think this is going to take off? Or do we think we're only going to have the first early adopters? And then I see you've unmuted. So do you want to go first? And then, guys, just feel free to, to chat and, uh, and discuss. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, I think I accidentally unmuted, but uh, no, no worries. Um, I think a couple of things uh, for us going forward. <clears throat> I'll pick up firstly on what John mentioned earlier, which is uh, collaboration. And and I think that, you know, if I were to use the pill analogy, right, you have here in the US, uh, you know, uh, Advil for headaches, right? And then you have Sudafed for um, uh, uh, congestion, r r you know, relieving congestion. But then you also have the combo, right? And I swear uh, the combo works better for me than taking the individual ones, right? So when I suffer a headache and I suffer congestion, I take the combo, right? I think it's a very good analogy that says um, collaboration uh, amongst ourselves. If I have uh, you know, uh, uh, an opportunity in diabetes and somebody else has an opportunity in mental health, and these are two fundamental things that kind of coexist for a patient with diabetes, perhaps there's an opportunity for collaboration. And it's not just collaboration as sharing best practices. It's actually removing those points of friction, right? So there's one part of me that says, you know, kind of going forward, uh, collaboration is absolutely critical. And it's also there from a business standpoint, it's what's going to create the scale that's required, right? At the end of the day, we're not, we, we can all individually, you know, push the brick wall with a, with a little hole. Uh, and the brick wall may not fall, but if we combine our forces together, the brick wall falls, okay? And so there's a notion of market critical mass. And I think, you know, people sometimes refer to it as critical mass. They use the words tipping point. Whatever the vernacular is, it's all the same physics principle, right? That we need a certain mass to move and create momentum for ourselves as an industry. And so I think that it's important that lessons are shared. It's important that best practices are shared. There's almost an opportunity, you know, Matthias, we used to do in my old management consulting role for years, we used to be involved in a lot of benchmarking in product development and benchmarking in, in, in supply chain management and technology delivery and things like that. I think there's an opportunity for the birth of a benchmarking opportunity in digital therapeutics that says, let's start to collect the key metrics that are germane and that, that go across the industry, right, across domains, across geographies. And let's start to Anonymize, it's okay. I don't need to know whose metric that is. Anonymize, but then start to understand what is best in class, what is industry average, because an I, as an individual, can use that as a, oh, I have a gap here. I, I'm really good here. I need to you know, improve here. No need to invest here, and that kind of thing. That's the way we're going to continuously improve, right? Uh, we're not going to improve if we don't measure. And so there's a part of me, it goes back to this concept of collaboration, co development, whatever you want to call it. I think that's an opportunity for, for, and, you know, there may be some logical pairings, right? Diabetes has certain comorbid conditions that it may not have others. So it may not be logical for me to collaborate with an oncology company, for, for example, probably not a good fit. But within my, you know, universe, uh, there's a smaller sphere of, of natural collaborators, right, uh, that are going to help me create critical mass. So just a thought to start the dialogue. So if I, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I just, I, I do think, you know, let's just pretend that we could get through payers and get through regulators. You know, I would think, I think what often gets forgotten is doctors and other clinicians getting it, okay? And actually saying, I don't care if there's a code, I don't care if it's paid for, I'm not gonna prescribe it, I don't get it. And I think it's really important to distinguish between software as a pill, in other words, again, it's an actual medicine. It's going to have the same effect 
on the end organ that a pharma drug could or a device could, right? Versus, you know, and in the case of diabetes, you know, the software isn't insulin. It's not an oral hypoglycemic, right? Whereas in the depression and the neurological space, the software is actually either potentiating or substituting for an antidepressant or for some other kind of drug like Ancanamab or something like that. So I think the big challenge for us is to say to a doctor, yes, actually this game is a substitute for an SSRI. It's a substitute for an anticholinesterase, right? It's an actual medicine that you can prescribe versus a kind of ecosystem, an information system, an automation system, an efficiency system that allows the actual delivery and assessment of pre-existing medicines. That's what I find, we, even listening to this conference and others, is that the distinction isn't really being fully made. And I think that we just need doctors to understand that sometimes it actually is the pill instead of insulin, instead of an antibiotic. And yeah, I so think that's what digital therapeutics in its purest form to be distinguished between digital health, digital medicine, assessment, information. So we'll get traction. Otherwise, it seems like a platform rather than an actual pill. Yes. Yeah, so so, so uh, just two thoughts to add to that, John. Um, so 50% of me agrees with you um, for all the obvious reasons. But 50% of me respectfully says, this is the fallacy of the all what we hear at these conferences, which is people think that there's one and only one pathway for a digital therapeutic to exist and be successful in the market. And it couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, if we narrow it down to that one pathway, then we restrict the value proposition and the value potential that we have to deliver from it. So in some cases, you're absolutely right. It very well could be the replacement. In some cases, it may not even be a replacement. It may be the therapy. It may be the de facto therapy because a pill doesn't exist, right? Think of our friend, uh, Eddie Martucci and Achille, right? There was no pill, it was the first FDA cleared a video game for, for uh, treating ADHD. So in his case, there's no even pill substitute. So now you all of a sudden three models. You have one model where it's the de facto treatment because the pill doesn't exist. In one case, it's what you said, which is a substitute. But in the case of, for example, in diabetes, a patient may not need to, it's, they don't inject the phone, they don't inject the app, but they get better outcomes than they do by taking drugs and they're able to manage their diabetes and get the A1C reductions by doing so. And so. If we, if we dare to challenge ourselves that it can't be just one model, then I think we achieve that critical mass faster and it uh, uh, supports everybody. And then to support what you did say, which is it's incumbent on the medical school systems. Think about it. The iPhone came out in 2007. The first iPhone generation kit is four years away from medical school, okay, All right? Do you think that they're going to go through medical school with a stethoscope? I don't think so. They're going to have different tools. And so I think it's incumbent to go right down into the grassroots and, and start to inculcate these things at that grassroots level such that doctors who are training to become physicians understand that, hey, I have an entirely different toolbox now. I have a toolbox of pills. I have a toolbox of cognitive therapy, I have a toolbox. Of, and so again, it goes to the multiplicity, multiplicity of therapy. So just a thought. And just, Marla, just if you just give me one second, just to reply, is, is I do think that the thing that medical schools have under taught physicians in particular is behavioral interventions. That's usually been outsourced to the allied health industries, to other people. I think that the point I was trying to make is that if you consider software's pill as a behavioral intervention that's prescribable, then maybe digital therapeutics is a way for the medical industry, the biomedical industrial complex, to become interested in behavior again as a treatment. And that is the sort of Trojan horse approach that I think would be really great for digital therapeutics. I'm so sorry to interrupt this amazing discussion because I could literally sit and listen to it all day, but we've got a few minutes left and we should probably start closing up and then if it was a normal conference we would all go to the bar and continue the discussion but unfortunately we are virtual so uh I, yeah but i'm sure i think there's some networking after this but i think um what i want everyone to do is um this is so interesting honestly is uh, go around and say like 
your nugget of wisdom you would like everyone to take away about the future so I'm like I want and I want something that isn't just like nice nice you know like your normal thing so it's great we're at the good point I want something to make everyone think right so give us that give us a good nugget of wisdom something to think about to take away from this session and I want to start with Elsie because I know you were uh, about to say something there in the chat as well so um thanks Nana um so, so to be honest the the kind of train of thought I have is very much in line with the discussion that John and, and Hans have been having just now regarding you know really I mean for me the the, out, the output that you want to achieve right at the end of the day is that in the right population in the right disease digital therapeutic is top of mind is the first thing that comes as an option to be offered to patients and comes as naturally as a medicine might come to mind for the treatment of disorder and you're really focusing here on you know impacting outcomes in the way of in the form of sort of improving symptoms preventing relapse really strong clinical outcomes here you know so you know i do agree that sometimes you know the the focus on all of the wider holistic value that is naturally inherent in the product like convenience you know ease of access engagement all of those fantastic things that we know do support better outcomes but it's still one step removed from the immediate association of a digital therapeutic with improved outcomes. And so um, at the end of the day, I think what we really need to do as, as a manufacturer and, and industry in this space is help prescribers, help patients immediately make that leap between a digital therapeutic and better outcomes. Instantaneous automatic assumption associated with it. It, much the same way as you would expect any medicine to give you better outcomes, right? That, that's the intent by default, you know, when you prescribe medicine. Yeah. If they can have that automatic, you know, uh, uh, link of the two, you know, that's really going to, um, you know, make be impactful in, in helping to push this industry forward and get the acceptance of the DTX. Thank you so much, Elsie. That's such a good point. Christian, to you, your 30 second takeaway. Yeah, so I mean, uh, maybe one thing to uh, leave you all with, uh, what we've done kind of pretty different than many others in our space has been to take a mind and body approach for treating mental health disorders. And, and the mind and body approach or the body and mind in some other disease categories is actually something where we've, you know, because of taking that approach, we've seen uh, dramatically better results. Uh, for uh, you know, large populations of patients uh, already now, and I, I think that in actually many disease areas, uh, taking that mind and body approach or body and mind approach um, could help us achieve a, a lot better clinical results uh, for for the patients, for the people out there. So, uh, some uh, food for thought there. Appreciate. It. Love that. Great, great insight there, Matthias. Do you want to go next? Your thirty seconds. So, um, coming back to your last question, Nada is. Is, is, is this an industry in terms of is the billion dollar market or whatever? If, if you look at the funding in, 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 in digital health and market evaluation for, for specific companies, there are people in the world who believe that this is the next big thing in healthcare. Okay. Uh, but please, Anand and John, please do not let us wait for the next generation of medical students to change. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to wait another 20 years. So uh, uh, I, I see your point, but please be a bit more sport, sportive here. So basically three things, right? Unity, evidence, and persistence. This is what we as an industry should, should focus on. As, as Anand said, with, you know, with, the, with the wall, let's hit it together, um, be persistent in this, and then create evidence. And at the end of the day, physicians, physicians will prescribe what, where they see evidence, policymakers will rely on evidence, at least in most countries and um, patients will always focus on things physicians recommend or where they see a value for their health in terms of outcomes. Brilliant points, brilliant points. John, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'll simply say this. Um, digital therapeutics, which is behavioral change through software, is going to be the primary way to deal with the biggest burden in the world right now, which is chronic disease. Uh, the Pharmaceutical and device approach has been predicated on the idea that we'll be able to treat chronic diseases like honorary acute infectious diseases, silver bullet approaches. It is not going to work. So digital therapeutics is the primary approach for chronic disease. 
and drugs and devices will be always there for acute diseases, but they will be secondary. Brilliant. Anand. Yeah, I'll take a very different uh, uh, line of thinking here uh, that summarizes um, the, the, what I heard, um, which is uh, some of you know I'm also a type 2 diabetes patient. I, I left a lucrative management consulting career after two decades to, to help, you know, WellDoc flourish. And um, I think Matthias's point is, is not just the unity, uh, it's the passion. And um, I think what you have here and certainly what you have in a lot of the industry leaders in this space is people who believe that this has to be the way. Failure isn't an option here, guys. Okay, failure isn't an option. And so, John's right. This is this this is going to open a brand new leaf uh, for the industry, saying this is how we can help manage chronic conditions. Yes, you're going to have drugs. Yes, you're going to have things like that. They're going to be adjuncts, whatever. This has to be almost the first modality because it's the scalable, cost-effective, highest reach, etc. Right? It has all those value propositions inherently because it's software. So. I think if we're passionate about the success and we believe, uh, then we'll create the movement, then we'll create the following, then we'll create the, we'll breach the wall uh, and then uh, we'll all pour in. And so I think it's important that we remain true to the mission behind what it is we're all doing uh, in all our respective walks. I think that's, if we lose that fuel, then we won't succeed. Wow, wonderfully said. And I really don't think I need to add much here because to end this, we've really discussed, you know, we've had Anand talking about how we have to have passion in the industry, treat it as a we, we are all in this together and we're building stuff for ourselves as well, right? Uh, we've had Mateus talking about how we really need to be building that evidence. We need to be making it as simple as possible so that people don't have to have this mission control. John, who's been saying, you know, it's all about making sure people know that this is the, you know, this is a, replacement and that it's it is a drug well it is a there you know it's the replacement for the drug and then it should be seen that way we've had christian talking about how all of his experiences have led him to see that you know that the slog is worth it and we will we will get there if we dedicate and persevere as mateus said and, and elsie who so eloquently discussed how there was really this momentum that is building in the industry. And if we stick by it, we, you know, something will really take off soon. And I think that you guys have presented this so wonderfully today. I'm really, really excited. And I think the one word I'm going to take away from this is collaboration. And so I hope that this is the first of many discussions. And thank you for such a riveting finale to this event. Bye, everyone. <laughs>